But today we're going to talk about eagles. I do want to talk just a little bit uh, to the children that were at youth camp. You did a fantastic job with listening and taking notes. Never once even thought about having to get uh, my attention turned from you. I appreciate the work your parents have done, your youth ministers did. Uh, that was fantastic. I enjoyed speaking with you. I hope I wasn't boring. Uh, but that was, uh, thank you for letting me speak and you're listening so well. Uh, I'm sorry this is the last way we do it, uh, but we're, uh, we're going to try to make the best of this anyhow. We're going to end off that camp and speak this morning about that of eagles. We're not speaking of the bald eagle, which we have in this area. When the Bible mentions eagles all but once, it's speaking of the golden eagle. Uh, there's one time the baldness of the eagle is mentioned, and we think that is uh, talking about the bald eagle. But I'll not be re referencing those at all. There are, there are several different stages that eagles are going to go through on their lifestyle. We will leave the last one alone as we look strictly at the illustrations that the text gives us. So I'm not so much worried about the theology during this sermon of what each one in context is referring to and the point he was wanting to make. I am wanting to make the point of the illustration. So we'll, uh, I'm careful of the doctrine. I won't hurt it at all. But we just want to talk about those. The three main categories I do want to talk about today that uh, eagles are going to go through and that they're probably most known for is a running stage and a catching stage and a building stage. Those three things are going to be going through as we talk about the eagle. So let's buckle up. We're in Job chapter number 39, 27, but I'm going through a lot of different passages. Uh, so they should be up over my shoulder, but I did change some way that the verses went, and if they show up different behind me, that is totally my fault. You have to give the, the audio-visual guys more than 30 seconds notice. Uh, that tends to help. But here's what Job 39, 27 says. Does the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? There's two things that's mentioned in this, uh, in this passage that not only refers to the eagle, but I think is going to help us also. Doth the eagle mount up at thy command? It's speaking about the ability of the eagle to fly. The, the eagles can fly higher than any other bird out there. They can fly higher than buzzards, vultures, falcons. Uh, the reason being is they have a separate lens that goes over their eyes so they can fly into the sun. If you're ever being chased by the devil's buzzards, fly into Jesus. You'll be able to see things they can't see. And as the brilliance of the sun out here will take the vultures away and they can't see the eagle anymore, you fly toward Jesus and the brilliance of Jesus will turn the bad guys away. That is something there. We also fly higher than any other bird out there. Why is that? Because we are living in heavenly places now. We not only live in the middle of the creation, but we can speak to the Creator and we can enter into His presence. And so we fly higher than anybody else. When the storms of life have captivated and held prison everybody else, the eagle uses the force of the wind and flies above the storm. So we can look down on it. And as pretty as it is from an airplane, eagles live that way all the time. Where others are drowned in their holes on the ground, the eagles are up untouched by the storms. It's an amazing thing. So they fly higher than anybody else. And it also says in that same text, they make their nest on high. No other animal builds a home that high. They go higher than the snakes are able to get them. I hope you caught that. The devil's talked about as a serpent. You hang out with Jesus, you won't have as much trouble with the devil. That's right. If you're going to follow Jesus, follow him. And you'll find out you don't have to fight him every day. Right. Matter of fact, there'll be times you'll find out that he may have thought about coming at you and went, no, nah, I think I'll just stay away. Uh, that's what the Bible tells us as we resist the devil. We go to Jesus, he'll flee from us. So those, there, there's two things. They make the nest high. And they also fly higher than any other creature. In speaking about their speed, 2 Samuel 1.23 is also going to mention some things about their speed. Uh, Jonathan and David uh, were lovely and pleasant in their lives. And in their death, they were not divided. 
they were swifter than eagles. Pretty interesting. They've, they've pulled out um, a, different cameras that can measure speed. And, and eagles generally fly at about 35 mile an hour. They flap only a quarter of the time. They ride the wind currents. They don't let currents force them down. They don't let the, they don't let the wind currents force them up. They use the situations they're in just to maintain life and to keep going. Uh, listen, we're trying to build airplanes learn how to do that. That wind will take them up instead of down. Uh, well, you've all been old long enough to hear these airplane crashes. I just tell you, when the, when the engines go out, you fall like a rock, not eagles. They've learned how to mount wind, and that's a great thing. But swift to the eagles, not only do they go around about 35 mile an hour, just on the regular. But if it's time to hunt, they have clocked them at 220 miles an hour. Wow. I drove 65 once. I drove 80 just a couple weeks ago out west. Something I was not comfortable with, I slowed back down to 70. Some guy on his bicycle passed me, speed up! You know, it was just crazy. It was just crazy. I'm not built for speed. You put me in a car that's got a V10, I'm going 70. That's it. You put me in a plane, that it, the Concorde, I'm going about 70. That's good for me. I'm not built for speed. I'm built for homecoming. I'm built for snack time. I'm built for lunch. You know, that's what I'm built for, not recess. That's not for me. 220 mile an hour on a power dive. No other animal but one falcon can go faster than that. Well, as we're speaking about and spoke about her making her nest on high, it, it takes me back to that passage again, but I'm going to add verse number 28 out of Job chapter 39. Doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth in a rock upon the crag of the rock and a strong place. Well, there comes a time in an eagle's life where they want to have a partner they're going to be with forever. Well, it goes a little bit different, not much different than it goes for, for us. Uh, for some, girls and boys still have cooties. Hold on to that as long as you can. It is true. <laughs> but if you got past the cootie stage and somehow you've forgotten that, There'll come a time where there's a bunch of male eagles down and they're playing on the ground throwing the pig skin. Ah, it's too big for them. The squirrel skin. They made a football out of squirrel skin. And they're just playing. And over top of them will be this female eagle. She has spent several hours that day taking care of her own feathers, just looking good. Maybe she's got a mirror. I would assume she does. Most females do. Most females have more than one. They'll have one big one in the bathroom. And that's what they check when they put their face on in the morning. If that's what you have to do. Uh, they'll also buy another one that's by the great big one because it wasn't good enough. And they'll buy one that goes out so they get right up on their face. And they can see any imperfection that's there. Personally, when I look into it, I scare myself. They'll also have one in the vehicle. They get in before they leave. They'll pull down the visor. There's mirrors there. On the passenger side because they know when a girl gets in there, she only walked about 25 feet out of her house. But she got to make sure everything's still perfect. And she'll pull down that visor. And when she gets to work and walks the 100 feet to work, She'll go and she pulls out this little, it's, it's not a ninja throwing star, but it could be just as deadly. And they open it up and there is some more makeup because they, they got to fix something because they may have had some air hit it. And then, they, I mean, they're loaded up with them. And that's what this girl eagle did. She just spent all day primping. Guy eagles, when they're young, you could tell they don't spend time primping. But the girl eagles, did. and she'll fly overhead and all the other eagles will stop. And they're just watching and then somebody calls out, call it, and he takes off. Well, when he's flying, trying to catch her, another one's next to him. He's like, dude, what? I told you I called it. No, but I seen her first. She's mine. 
And so then they get in a scuffle. And these two eagles will fight and cut each other with razor sharp talons until one of them goes, she's not worth it, and leaves. Yield quickly. <laughs> the one of them who's just been through a massive fight with another eagle, at his age when he's looking, he's about 20 pounds. The female is going to be about 28 to 35 pounds. Female eagles are a little bit bigger than male eagles. I'm drawing no conclusions there. <laughs> They're a little bit bigger. Anyhow, he flies up to meet her and immediately she will play a game of chase. Now the only reason we know this happens is because people have climbed way up on tall, tall mountains with cameras and they have videoed this. And if it hit National Geographic, we know it's true. So she just flies. And the guy is behind her. He's bleeding. He's tired. He's just been in a fight. And he's trying to convince her to stop. He's the only one doing any type of screeching at all. Hey, baby, why don't you stop? And she does it. She just keeps flying. Where usually she's got a 30, 40 mile radius, she now just keeps on flying. And after a while, it's like, baby, please stop. Please. I can't go no further. And she just keeps going. The only time that she will do anything is when she thinks he's had it. She'll fly to the ground, she'll pick up a small stick, and she'll fly right back up into the air again with that small stick, and this guy's still following her because he don't have no sense. She's playing games with him. Don't you date no girl gonna make you play games. She flies up and begins just to make giant figure eights. They're about 15,000 feet up in the air. We can't breathe there, they can. And, the, and she just doing figure eights. And he's like, babe, what are we doing? This makes no sense. I got my crib. You know, we need to go. I got some wheels. We, need to, we got something. And she keeps going. She drops the stick. And somehow, either through a look or gives him the big feather or something, she tells him to go get it. He's like, really? You went down to the ground. You caught a stick. You all the way up. I've just been in a fight. And you want me to go catch the stick. And she makes another squawk at him. And he's like, Okay. And he goes down and catches the stick before it touches the ground and brings it back. She gets the stick from him. She flies back to the ground. Instead of getting a stick this big, she goes to Walmart and buys a stick this big. She flies back up into the air. She begins to do circles this time. She's no longer at 15,000 feet. Now she's at about 9,000 feet and she's just doing figure eights. He's like, I ain't catching no more sticks for you. I done played enough of your games. And and then again, this argument, and she just keeps flying his figure eights, and she drops that stick, and whatever she does to get his attention to go get him, he'll fly down to go pick him up. He catches the stick. It's much bigger. It's heavier. He's got less time to respond. She's stronger than he is. He's been in a fight. He's wore out. But for everything he's got, he's going to pull that stick back up. And when she gets the stick from him, she'll go back to the ground, and she'll pull out something about six feet long, seven feet long. And he's like, no. I've had enough of this. We go to Starbucks. You don't got to do this. She flies up. She's only about five, six hundred foot off the ground. And as soon as she lets go, he dives for it. When he catches that, and it doesn't touch the ground, they're married. They fly straight up in the air together, several thousand feet. They lock talons together, and they free fall down to the ground to where they almost hit the ground then they fly off they're married no wedding planners no rehearsal dinners it was free and i think what a great idea except the bleeding in a fight playing games catching stuff and just for those that went to camp it is never a good idea to marry or date a girl that's bigger than you are and can body slam you number one rule Never. Because once she body slams you, it's over. You become a chicken instead of an eagle. They're only laughing because most of them guys are chicken. They know. That's why we buy big bed posts so we have something to roost on at night. After this, he will be, and they're married. She will find this place in the mountainside and she'll begin to have a nest built. She also helps in picking up the sticks. This 32, 35 pound eagle 
is going to build until she's got about a two-ton nest. Why does anything weighing 35 pounds need a two-ton nest? Why does anything weighing 115 pounds need a... Never mind. Just doesn't make sense to me. We would still live in caves if it wasn't for females. I just want to let you know. <laughs> After they get it built and she agrees to it, she wants to decorate. And you will find that she will go hunting. He will go hunting. They'll bring back rabbit fur and they'll put it over here. They'll bring back squirrel fur over here, pat it. Calico cat over here. Yapping dog down here. She's padded this whole place so she doesn't have to feel sticks hitting her stomach. Because if she's not comfortable and happy, nobody's happy. So what they do? The eagle stirs. Does she mount up the command and make her nest on high? She dwells and abides on the rock, upon the crag of the rock, strong place. She's living in a place where she has no natural enemies. Well, as time would have it, she gets to the place where she gets very moody, giant hot flashes, can't control her emotions, and she's starting to put on a little bit of weight. I said little way to wait because there's females here. She's going to have babies. She'll have three. Just for the purpose of the story, I wouldn't know anybody has three children anyhow. She'll have all three of these. And at the moment that the eggs are given, the man gets kicked out of the house. And he will build a small nothing of a nest about 100 foot up above her. And that's where he gets to stay. Children, that's why you don't marry a woman bigger than you. That's where he gets to stay. She will roost on these. She will keep them warm. She's going to have them. And let's just say she's had a great egg-laying time and births out three little eaglets. Baby eagles. One eagle's an eagle. Three would be e eaglets. I don't know. So anyhow, she has these three and they, they're born. They're ugly little things. They don't have feathers. They don't know how to do much but just open their mouth and go, feed me, feed me. And they're not hungry. But they're still wanting that attention. It's the husband's job to go out and find all the food that's needed. And he brings it back and those three kids eat all of it. And he gets nothing. The wife will eat what she wants throw the rest away and she may say I want I want squirrel this morning and they have watched eagles pass over rabbits and ferrets and minks they've passed over all of them just to go specifically get so there's no telling what that guy was told to go get until he actually goes and gets it and he brings it back home these little things have some personalities about them all children do you've got three little ones I'm going to try to name them and keep those names correct as I go through there. But they weren't my kids, so I really don't have to know their names. We'll just have a little Jeffrey, Mikey, Billy. That'll work for me. You have these three little kids that are there, and they find out at a very young age that they have beaks. And little Mikey reach over to Tommy or Jeffrey, Jeffrey, pop, hit him. And he does what any other child would do. Mom! And he'll scream. And it'll keep happening. Now he remembers what happened to him. And a little bit later, he goes and gets his brother, Billy. Come here. When he turns around, we need popping. And so they get him, they pay the receipt. You know, they got to get him back. Pop! They hit the other one. But you know, when they start fighting like that, something happens chemically inside of a woman. I'm telling you, children, it's a scary thing. Something happens chemically in them. When I was growing up, they called it conniption. And I'm not sure what the medical definition was for that. It's, it's along the line of leprosy or rabies. But nowadays, they call it freaking out. And when mamas freak out, they don't want held accountable for the freaking they do. Although it may have been sinful. 
I'm going to move on from that. The little kids are busy popping each other in the head, making each other cry. And then the Bible gives us something that's going to happen in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 11. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth her broad her wings, taketh them, beareth her on her wings. Three of those tell us what she does in particular at that moment. Mom jumps out on top of all of them and spreads out that seven foot wingspan and just starts beating the tar out of those children. Woo! Down three of them go. One of them decides to get back up. Woo! All three of them get hit again. And she just does this until the kids are in the corner trying to learn how to breathe again. Now you may have never experienced this because we live in a different generation where we think that's a bad idea. But in my generation, it was when you got a whooping that was a whooping that was bad enough that you just sit in the corner going <laughs> trying to figure out how to get your brain to tell your lungs to work properly. The mom's done, the dad's been yelling at you boys better stop, but they don't want to stop. And so they just get beat up something terrible. After the kids are in the corner doing their crying, mom's not done. She starts throwing furniture out. Everything that's in the middle, I think we called that yapping dog. She'll take it and throw it out. And the husband's like, dude, no, sorry, girl, I worked hard for that. She's like, hey, now he's got a problem. He married a girl bigger than him. He just, so he's got to stop. He ain't even living at the house now because of this. Now when the kids get back up, here's what they figure out. Those sticks underneath there hurt. And so they do something they've never had to do before. They push up with their legs to move. Mom knows if you keep kids comfortable enough, they'll never move. One thing we could see at camp this week, we know who those who are babysit on games and those who are not. Those that play games a lot are good for about 10 minutes, and then they're done, but the complaining is not. Those that aren't raised on games are still playing, having a great time. Not that I'm indicting anybody in particular. We just saw some stuff. If you don't make it uncomfortable at the house, they'll never do anything. And that does not bless children. That curses children. If you grow up lazy, you're cursed. If your parents allowed you to grow up lazy, you live under a curse. You won't be able to keep a job. You'll never have nice things because you were lazy. That Your parents need to push and make things uncomfortable. And as I mentioned on M Monday, at your age now, you should already be making your bed, keeping your rooms clean. You shouldn't have to be told that. Ants are never told, and they have itty-bitty brains. Uh, you could do better than that. Well, after the beating takes over, young, youngins have an incredible ability to forget the beating that they had. But now they've got legs. They've never used them much anymore. i uh, used them before. And they got these little sharp things on the end of it. Billy remembers what Mikey told him on, and Jeffrey got the part of it. And so he just comes up behind and takes that claw and goes, <laughs> and he does what anybody else does when they get scratched real bad on the back. And as he screams and hollers, the dad's going, you know what's going to happen to her. It's like the Incredible Hulk. She's going to change on you. They try to calm down the best they can, but kids can't calm down. You know, there's just something in them. To quote that great theologian Cosby, they have to have beatings before they go to bed at night. What, was that too quick? I shouldn't have used him. Shouldn't have used him, Sorry. So they start up their claw fighting again. Mama comes back from shopping. She's got herself a nice little dove, and she sees what's going on. The children are bleeding, and Mom jumps on them again. But this time, it's different. This time, she doesn't just mow them over with her giant wings. Whoa, whoa! She reaches up and grabs the first one, and she holds him down with her big claw, and she grabs this little wing that has never moved before in its life. I don't know if you've ever had a cast on or not, but when you take that cast off, the first thing the doctor wants to do is straighten stuff out. Because he loves people to be in pain, that's why. Physical therapists to do it to you too, kids. You've got to watch out for them. They get paid to hurt people for a living. 
And mama will grab that little wing that has never moved from here and she will stretch it out to here. And little Mikey about faints. It's terrible. And he, he gets weak in the knees and the other two boys are like, what, what? It was his fault anyhow, mom. We good. She rolls him over, grabs the other wing, begins to pull on it. And he's just screaming. They're thinking about jumping. The dad's just looking at him going, I told you it's going to happen. Well, after the one that started it is down there trying to learn how to breathe again, she reaches over and grabs Billy and holds him down. He's like, I'm sorry. Pulls, 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 pulls. She gets done with him. The other one looks and says, you're a terrible parent, Mom. Pulls him down on the ground and starts pulling his arms. The eagle knows this, that if she never does flutter over her nest and spread abroad wings, in particular her wings there, but spreads them abroad, them kids will never learn how to fly. That's why I hope you don't let your parents do your homework for you. I hope you let them help teach you and guide you. But a terrible parent's going to do your homework for you. You'll never learn how to make it. You have to make up your mind young. You're going to be something when you're older. You'll never be it. So you got three little kids now learning how to breathe. All of them standing in the nest going, I ain't my mom. I hate her. Uh, because she just she had to take care of some business. After a couple months. After a couple of months. The kids are now big enough. They figured out that there's a reason all the furniture is gone. Mom wants them walking. No comfortable places anywhere. And they've also got these little wings that have feathers on them. And they found that if the wind's coming up the side of the cliff real well, they can put their wings out and they come up off the nest. And they're like, Mom, did you just see that? She's been doing that for a living her whole life. But she's like, oh, ain't that just precious? And, and the other one is sticking his arms out. And, and the same thing happens. And they're all having a great time at it. It's just wonderful. And they do that for weeks and weeks. Mom, look, mom, look, mom, mom, mom. Can you believe this? Mom, can we think? And then finally, little Jeff remembers the beating he took because Billy started the fight with Michael. And they start fighting again. This time they got sharp beaks. This time they got sharp talons. And mom wastes no time. She flies down in the middle of them. And all of them go. <gasps> because they know it's coming. Big shocker that it's coming. And she takes that giant wing of hers. And. <laughs> knocks Mikey right out the nest. <laughs> Mikey's falling. The other two get to the back of the nest. They're trying to blend in like a ninja. So nobody sees them. And he's falling, and he's screaming, and the mom is screaming back at him as the dad makes a certain whistle, and he puts his wings out, and the wind catches him and blows him straight up past the nest. And as he's flying around, he lands back down on the nest and went, Mom, did you just see that? The other boy goes, I, I, don't, I don't ever want to learn how to do that. Mom reaches over and grabs him, shoo, throws him out the nest, and down he goes. His brother immediately jumps out after him. It's easy. Do it this way. And now those two are going at it. Dad's flying around. Mom's screaming at him, and, and he puts his wings out, shoo, right up above the nest he goes. They're both screaming, hollering, this is so cool. They got their driver's license. Jeffrey's in the back. He's a little, little smaller than the other ones. He's the runt. He's just staring at his mom. And his mom, as she's watching her other kids in such fine adoration of what they're doing, she looks at him. I don't love you, and I'm calling Division of Social Services on you. And she grabs him and knocks him, slap out the nest. He's a little bit smaller. He doesn't weigh as much. And his brothers are by him. Do this. I'm doing this. It's not working. <laughs> and finally, the mom does something. She looks at the husband, makes a noise, go catch him. Long before they ever got married and had children, she found out something. This man knows how to catch things when they fall. And he goes down and he says in Exodus 19.4, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. So that father goes down 
catches a little eaglet between his shoulder blades and flies him back up. He needs a little more time, but he's going to make it. And he also knows something. If I fall, my father can catch me. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, unto him who is able to keep you from falling. A couple thousand years ago, several, several thousand years ago, man fell in the garden. They had no opportunity to make things right. The law was too hard. They couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. Before the foundation of the world, the Bible tells us that Jesus told his father, I will go and I will pay their price to catch them when they fall. It's the great thing about being a believer in Christ Jesus, being an eagle Christian. There are some times that we are terribly going to mess up. God the Father already knows. He's got Jesus there. And he's never missed one. Not one of his, he's always caught him. So that's how it goes. Now they're married. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That deals with the moping period. Uh, Barry Goodman gave a sermon a long time ago. I also read two books about the same topic. We'll cover that on another date. But there just comes a time when people get tired and they need help. And God has provided a way for you to do that. The way they get theirs done is through a serious time of medication, a serious time of meditation, a serious time of recovery. Because sometimes life just gets too strong. And here the remedy is, just wait on the Lord. And in the Hebrew, I can't tell you what he meant by that. Because both of these principles are true and Hebrew is so fluid versus what Greek is, I, I don't know. It can mean one or two things. Those that wait upon the Lord could be like when you show up to Walmart and they've got one cashier and 30 potentials, but only one is open. And you're going to have to wait. There are times you may ask for something and the Lord tell you you're just going to have to wait. And it is good for you to have to wait there were sometimes I asked for things that I thought were great that would have hurt me there are other things that I asked for that was the right thing but it was just not God's timing and it was perfect when he gave it to me we just wait on him and through a great deal of experience for myself and for those that have been believers for a while you can trust God to do what's right even if you're uncomfortable you can trust him to do what's right or the second thing it's like a waiter. If you ever go to a restaurant that costs enough money, they're going to have a waiter there for you. They're going to, that's what they're there for. What can I do to help you today? What can I do to be of assistance to you? It's when we look at the Lord in the morning and go, I'm at your disposal. What do you need for me to do? What is it that today I can do to be a benefit to your kingdom work down here? Those that wait on the Lord, it's going to be helpful to them, and it'll carry them through a time of, for them, molting. But for us, you might fight depression every once in a while. Just start waiting on him and watch him bring you through it. And then what's going to happen? He'll satisfy thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. Psalm 103.5, the Lord will give you what you need to be able to make it and be effective in this world. Even if at times your mom's just busting the house up and you with it. Even if at times she's doing stuff or your dad's doing stuff you just don't understand, God does. And it's for the benefit of the believer for God to do that to us. We had a great Sunday school lesson this morning that talked about how our suffering and assurance is put together. Growing up can be tough. Growing up could stink. I've had people ask me, Preacher, wouldn't you like to do it all over again? Not on your life. If I could start over with Lynn, I'm good. Don't start me before that. Being a kid sometime was just terrible. God the Father knows what you need. He's given you pastors, shepherds. He's given you youth ministers, moms, dads. 
people that love God that'll help you get through it to where when you're just not satisfied, God will give you what you need to be satisfied and you get your strength back and start walking again. I'm not sure where you're at in your Christian walk. Some of you told me at camp and some of you here at church has told me where you're at. It's allowed me to pray better for you. For some, it could be through the depression time. For some, it could be through getting the arms stretched or the legs pulled or something of the sort. Or others, you're just looking for a mate. Um, God has answers for us. And His answers will be what's best. 